Hello and welcome to Deprogrammed on Unsafe Space. My name is Carrie Smith. I'm here with my co-host Carter Laren. And we have a very special guest today that I'm excited for you guys to meet. This this man is, I would say, one of uh, my personal heroes or people that I look up to that helped me to figure my way out of what I call the social justice cult or social justice ideology. People have different words for it. I sometimes call it a cult. Um, I'm going to let Carter do the official introduction, but right. can I can I say who it is? Go we have ahead. Brett Weinstein today, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we do have Brett Weinstein, and if you have been living under a rock and don't know who Brett Weinstein is, uh, Brett Weinstein spent the last two decades advancing the field of evolutionary biology, earning his PhD at the University of Michigan before teaching at the Evergreen State College for 14 years, from which he resigned his tenure position in 2017. He's developed a new Darwinian framework based on design trade-offs and made important discoveries regarding the evolution of cancer, senescence, and the adaptive significance of moral self-sacrifice. He's currently working to uncover the evolutionary meaning of large-scale patterns in human history and seeking a game-theoretically stable pattern forward for humanity. With his wife, Heather Haying, he is co-writing A Hunter-Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, and is the host of Brett Weinstein's Dark Horse Podcast. You can follow him on Twitter at Brett Weinstein, or you can go to the Dark Horse Podcast, basically wherever podcasts are found. Uh, Dr. Weinstein, welcome to Deprogrammed on Unsafe Space. Hi, guys. Thanks for that lovely introduction. Glad to be here. So I think Carrie doesn't want me to jump into some stuff that I definitely want to talk about with you. But first, oh, you, you want to talk, talk about, about unity. And, so, so go <laughs> ahead, Carrie. I will shut up for wanna, the first half. Yeah, I'd like to talk about unity also. But first, for anyone who is living under a rock, I don't want to go through the whole story. But could I ask you a couple of questions about Evergreen? Of course. Would of that course. be okay? Yep. So when I first saw, for anyone who doesn't know, you were uh, sort of the face of some of the... I would say the extremes that were happening at college campuses in 2017. And a lot of the things that Carter and I were witnessing at the time unfolding and things that were happening to you and, and on other campuses at the time, there were friends of mine on the left, liberals, who were saying that we I was making a mountain out of a molehill and that these things were limited to college campuses and that this is just the way young people are and that this is never we're never going to see this in the real world and that I should calm down. I think it's safe to say flash forward to 2020 that we're starting to see some of that in the mainstream especially in the past few months. And I wanted to ask you if um what are some what are some lessons I think what are some lessons that people can take from Evergreen about where things might be headed in our culture? Great question. I would say one thing is we we have this expression, making a mountain out of a molehill, and we need the opposite one. Maybe I'm just unaware of what it is, but somehow your friends were standing so far away from the mountain that they thought it was a molehill. And uh, those of us who were standing closer knew better, but had trouble raising the alarm. So I, I guess we do have uh, Cassandra, Canaries in a coal mine, these sorts of things. But if you were close up on this phenomenon, it was very clear that this was lethal and there was no conceivable way that it wasn't going to move out of colleges and into all of the places that college graduates go. So the lack of imagination, the failure of imagination that we saw on the part of so many was really a question of wishful thinking on their part. They didn't want to believe that this ideology was going to topple institution after institution. And as long as it was only showing up on college campuses, it was simple for them to assume that there was some direct connection between those two phenomena. And I certainly heard the dismissals as often as anyone, you know, college kids behave this way, they'll grow out of it, that sort of thing. But no, that wasn't what this was about. This is a horizontal uh, revolution in which, although the claims that this ideology levels are quite foolish, the strategy it deploys is incredibly sophisticated probably not because anybody sat down to blueprint it, probably because it evolved and therefore um, learned our vulnerabilities. It found our blind spots and maneuvered its way in. Um, but, you know, there are many lessons and some of them have been well discussed. There is a question about um, bending, attempting to be generous in the face of 
this ideology, uh, which tends to embolden it. And so it is perhaps counterintuitive for those who like to extend the benefit of the doubt that they should not under any circumstances apologize for anything that they don't actually feel they have done wrong. But it's quite clear that that is the case, that to the extent that one apologizes uh, in an effort to extend an olive branch, it only makes things worse. And the other lesson is I think people need to learn to extrapolate and then they need to remember to do it because there is nothing that has happened in 2020 that wasn't foreseeable from 2017 if you were simply willing to project forward. This is all quite clearly a direct result of things that were already being deployed. And if you want to function in life, seeing things ahead is the key. This was the warning and we blew it. I feel very much like uh, I was put through absolute madness that gave an exact description of what would take place in 2020, and it was for nothing, because by and large it was a small number of people who saw the import, and a large number of people dismissed it, and here we are. You mentioned the strategy as like a... I think when people talk about there, there being a strategy here, it sounds conspiratorial, but you explicitly said, no, no, I think, you know, they didn't plan it out. It evolved, which I, which I like. Can you talk about what that strategy is so people can kind of better understand how it has metastasized like this? Sure. So, by the way, I don't think it entirely evolved. I think it's, like many things, a hybrid. You know, we certainly see inside of postmodernism a description about uh, you know, toppling fields and things like that. So it has been discussed in certain places. But by and large, the modern version of it is the result of an exploration where people make certain claims and most of those claims fall, but every so often they make a claim that is invulnerable for one reason or another. You know, the idea that black lives matter those of us who believe in equality find it very hard to field the question of whether or not we will agree that black lives matter, because of course, black lives do matter. And if you're paying attention, you know they're undervalued in the West, and especially in the US, and that that's a real problem that you want solved. On the other hand, if when you sign up for the concept of black lives matter, you are uh, automatically subscribed to the organization, then you've signed up for a whole slate of beliefs that have nothing to do with this and in fact would be counterproductive to the progress of blacks in America. For example, the belief that there is some problem based in the nuclear family and that the nuclear family must be dismantled is a preposterous notion. So the Black Lives Matter is something that hovers in a gray area. One wants to embrace it conceptually, and one cannot embrace it in terms of emboldening the organization that, that goes under that label. And so we all tend to fumble when, uh, when we are handed that question. But the key element of the strategy that has evolved is it plays people's narrow interest, their self-interest in time and in space against their long-term interest. So you will typically be presented with a question, as I was, will you apologize for your racism? Now, I'm not a racist. I had no racism to apologize for, but the choice was stark. If I said that I wasn't a racist, I would be portrayed as worse than a racist. I would be portrayed as a racist who wasn't even self-aware enough to see the problem. And if I had apologized, then I would have fueled the movement. And so, um, as people who know the Evergreen story know, um, the meltdown of the college and the centrality of my story to that meltdown was um, very colorful, and it radically altered my life, something over which I had very little choice. So, when people are faced with this, when somebody shows up in a cafe and says, you know, do black lives matter? And instructs you to raise a black power fist, you are left with a choice. Do I want to, in this moment, do something that I'm not comfortable with? Or do um, I want to stand up and say no and potentially have the image of me resisting what claims to be about racial equality broadcast over the internet and spend 
potentially the rest of my life fielding questions about whether I am or am not a racist. And for most people, there's no comparison. It's very inexpensive to say something you don't mean in the moment and very costly to live the rest of your life in the context of some famous piece of video. So person after person finds the expedient thing to do in the moment, which leaves the impression that civilization is awakening to some understanding and a small number of resistors uh, are the only remaining obstacle and we must all deal with them, which is a false story. But, um, but nonetheless, people being uh, gamed on the basis that they have a short-term interest and a long-term interest, and the short-term interest tends to dominate, is the key feature of the strategy. I was going to say, I think your point about the long-term interest is, is a good one, because we've interviewed several people in the uh, online knitting world and sewing communities who've been dealing with social justice explosions. I don't know if you know this, but there have been a lot of SJW wars in online knitting. And we talked to small... <laughs> yeah, it's a big rabbit hole. Uh, we talked to several small business owners who were targeted, and there was a very stark difference between the small business owners who bent the knee and made the apology for things that they didn't say or mean uh, in the short-term interest. It felt like, well, this will go away if I do this. And, and then the people who refused to take the knee, who were called everything from white nationalists to racist, you know, white supremacists, Horrible people that all of, everyone they worked with, um, they, they were they they were basically the target of harassment campaigns where they were canceled from conventions. Their book launches were uh, destroyed in some cases. People that they worked with were called to the carpet to denounce them. But in the long term, those businesses who did not take the knee are free to do whatever they want, and and. The three of the ones Carter and I've talked to are thriving now, whereas those who took the knee at the beginning for the short-term interest, they're beholden to the social justice mob with every decision they make. And they're continuing to find that like one apology is not enough and you're sort of owned by these people. So I don't know if I have a, a question at the end of that other than uh, how, how would you help people see if they can't see past the short-term goal? Like what are the long-term benefits of, of of standing up, of saying, no, I'm not going to do this thing I don't believe in. It depends how many people do it. Um, so I will say uh, what I hear you talking about with respect to what's happened in knitting circles, which is a hilarious place for this to have unfolded, I suppose, if you're not involved there, it's hard to imagine that knitting circles are virulent bastions of racism. So there's that. But um, the problem is, I know plenty of stories that went the other way, where people who stood up no longer have their businesses. Now, this may be a question of what part of the country you're in. I know a coffee roaster, Ristretto Roasters here in Portland, um, has uh, had its business come crashing down around false accusations of racism. Um, you know, we've seen other examples in baking, which I guess is um, tantamount to, is very similar to the the knitting question. Um, but I think the the problem is if many people stand up, then this is simple. If people process this individually, then it's not. And I would love to, and in fact, I'm frequently asked by people who want to stand up to advise them to do it. They'll come to me and they'll say, you know, basically they want to be comforted that if they stand up, it's going to be all right. And from the point of view of the well-being of society, I should probably tell them, yeah, stand up, it'll be fine, you're doing the right thing. But I can't in good conscience because I know that it's very dangerous and they may not be all right. Now, the other side of that is if you don't stand up, you won't be all right for exactly the reason you point out, Carrie. So in some sense, it's not that standing up is the right thing to do because it will save you. It's that the other process is a slow burn that will result in you potentially even losing your capacity to think. Because what happens to many of these people who choose in the moment to, to sign up for this ideology is that it becomes so uncomfortable to, uh, to give voice to these lies and it feels so degrading that people start convincing themselves that they actually believe it. They rationalize and they 
they are overtaken by this belief system. So, you know, for many of us, that's such an apocalyptic notion that there really isn't any choice. You, you have to stand up in the moment or any other time. But for those who are debating the merits in one way or another, uh, it's, it's actually a difficult choice. Is there something wrong, though, that we've reached? I mean, maybe I'm just old fashioned. I don't know. But is there something wrong where we've, we've reached a spot in society where so many people are, are, are looking at this in a very pragmatic sense and rather than a sense of, no, one stands up for one, what one believes in, regardless of the consequences? Uh, or were we just never in a society like that? And I'm naive. I, I don't know. Um, no, I think that something has changed. And I, I must say, I spend a lot of time trying to figure out exactly what it is. But it was not so unusual that people would take great risks for something that they believed in. And I find it strange that in the face of a threat to civilization, a threat to the West itself, that so many people are making a narrow calculation. Yes, your reputation is in jeopardy, and what's more, your, your capacity to earn is in jeopardy. But at the same time, it's not like you're being asked to storm a machine gun nest, right? That happens too in history. Sometimes you have to lay down your life um, for a cause. And I think there's something about modern existence that is so easy in so many ways and asks so little of us that when people are asked to put something substantial on the line, most of them don't have the, the circuitry to allow them to figure out how to even do it. So I do think uh, if we make it through this spasm, we need to somehow upregulate that strength of character that allows people to stand up when that's the right thing to do and not ask the question about, you know, where are my narrow interests? Because it is the wrong question in the face of something that is um, this dangerous. Yeah. Can you, um, to go back to your point about how the strategy is sophisticated and it partially because it, it evolved that way, there's there's something about the ideology that when I try to explain it to people, how it's, sometimes it sounds almost as if the ideology itself is a living thing. And, and I don't know how it's because, because as Carter said, people, if you, if you talk about the end goals of this belief system are X, Y, Z, or this is where this leads, or this is where I think this leads, or these are the desires of the belief system it sounds like a conspiracy theory that there must be people want to know who the bad guys are, who's pulling the strings. And I don't think they're bad guys. I, I think of it more like a school of fish that's moving in one direction. And sometimes there are fish that you reckon that are getting more attention than others <laughs> who are speaking the beliefs uh, publicly and getting accolades for it. But, but there's no, for the most part, there's no one leader that I can point to. Uh, have you had any success in trying to describe not just this ideology, but I guess any any belief system? Have you had what's a way that people can better understand how it functions? It's a fantastic question. I'm going to push back a little bit on okay. the idea that there are no bad guys. There are bad guys, but they're not very common, right? This movement is not built of bad people. It's built of potentially good people. And a few bad people are playing a disproportionate role. And what I would say is this is actually a, a standard feature of complex systems. When I was teaching evolution, I used to tell students that there were a lot of things that were substantially true, but you, you didn't want to fall in love with one of these concepts overly so because it would blind you to some other concept that was equally necessary. So the example that I like is the belief that to understand ants, you have to understand that the colony is really an organism. Now, in many ways, the colony is an organism, and it's very difficult to understand an individual ant on its own. On the other hand, if you imagine that an ant is therefore just like a cell, you also won't understand ants. You have to understand that there are aspects of a colony that are very organism-like, and there are aspects of an individual ant that are very 
uh, organism like, and those two truths have to live together. So what we have with respect to this um, woke ideology is a hybrid. We have something that has a theoretical core where people have actually mapped out a certain amount of strategy. And then we have an emergent phenomenon where people are discovering things that they can say and do that happen to work. And those things spread because they're understood to be effective. And the combination is very potent. Um, the fact that it has no leaders means that it's very difficult to challenge. Um, so the movement gets away with a lot of stuff on the basis that you know, those are bad apples to the extent that you view something as very negative. It's like, well, you're not going to hold me responsible for the worst people in this movement, are you? Um, but so, it, you know, it gets the advantage of all of those uh, extreme tactics. But it also means that it has no capacity to disavow anything. You know, if there were leaders, they could say, you know, they could enforce discipline around uh, avoiding violence. But as it stands, we're in this mind-numbing conversation about whether, you know, 93% peaceful is actually appallingly violent or whether it is, uh, you know, the 7% is an anomaly. So um, the, the fact of a, you know, the movement is composed of people. They think about what they're doing. Um, it is also composed of entities that are navigating the way we all navigate life and discovering that uh, they have certain advantages and just continuing to, to do what has worked. And we cannot overly focus on either one of these. It's very dangerous if we say, you know, these are, uh, you know, that there are no bad people involved. And it's very dangerous to imagine that this is, you know, tens of thousands of bad people. Neither one of these things is correct. I have a, a follow-up question about that. I watched your... So one of the first videos I saw of yours that really stuck with me and helped me to better understand what I was coming out of was your lecture called How the Magic Trick is Done. And in that video, the thing, I haven't watched it in a while, but the thing that really stood out to me was you describing um, the ways in which liberals, and for lack of a better word, I'm just going to say SJWs or leftists, the ways in which they... Uh, they walk together for a certain portion of of this trip, and then they they part ways pretty drastically. And that liberals kind of don't, or at least I didn't see that we weren't. I wasn't on the same path as SJWs. That we shared. We we were on the same path up until a certain point. And you described two different types of people in this movement. You described bad actors and, and useful tools. And that's the day I learned I was a tool. But also, <laughs> Carter says there's a lot of tools in this movement. <laughs> but uh, but but I, I wanted to ask you, do you after after I heard that, I had I had also heard an, a piece of an interview with Dr. Jordan Peterson, one of his grad students, um, in which they they talked about a study they had done and where they divided people in this ideology roughly into PC authoritarians and PC liberals. Are you familiar with that study? I'm not familiar with the study, or it's possible oh, okay. I am, but if, if I am, I've forgotten it. But I've certainly okay. uh, thought about the concept quite a bit. So they basically, they said they were looking at personality differences between people who subscribe to social justice ideology. And they found that uh, PC liberals, they divided them into two groups, and they had a couple of interesting differences. They had a lot in common, but they had a couple of interesting differences. The PC liberals had high verbal cognitive ability and... Uh, the PC authoritarians also had, they had a very high disgust sensitivity, so they were more like authoritarians, the, the ones I used to think of authoritarians being on the right. Um, and then the PC authoritarians also had uh, a tendency to have some type of mood or personality disorder, which I thought was interesting. And so I started, I started, and maybe this is wrong with me, but I started thinking of the PC authoritarians more as the bad actors that you were talking about and the PC liberals as the useful tools. Um, yeah, I think that's a fair characterization. And I think there is a lot of dysfunction in this movement. A lot of people who, well, frankly, I think there's a tell. They have attacked the idea of merit and meritocracy and achievement 
And in some sense, as sad as it is to say, and as awkward as it is to say, I think a large number of the rank and file in this movement are people who feel like, um, given meritocracy, they would be on the losing end, and therefore they have little to lose by attacking the very concept and declaring it racist somehow. Mm. Um, I also think there's a great deal to the idea that there is a basic authoritarian personality type, maybe it is a disorder, but nonetheless that many of these people, frankly, if the winds were blowing the other way, would be just as happy as authoritarians on the right, that really, in some sense, what they enjoy, this fraction of the movement, is the ability to boss other people around. And they will do it with whatever ideological tools are available at the moment, but it has nothing to do with ideology. With respect to the distinction between uh, PC liberals and PC authoritarians, um, it is fairly clear that many of the people who sign up for this ideology only loosely understanding what it's advocating yes believe that it is about achieving equality and so the distinction between what we intuitively understand equality to mean and what equity has been retooled to mean is vital it sounds like they are nearly synonyms but in fact the way equity is being used it defines a um, well, what I have said elsewhere is you have people who want to end oppression. I would be included in that. I would imagine you both would as well. And you have people who want to turn the tables of oppression. And this turning the tables of oppression is this authoritarian mindset. What's worse, it's not even turning the tables of actual oppression. It's turning the tables of imagined or claimed oppression, which may not even have existed. And so... At some level, this movement is about the redistribution of power and resources according to essentially a mythological description of who is entitled and who is in debt. And, um, you know, it, it will end badly, but there are a great many people who really think that what they're doing is fighting oppression who are going to be shocked in the end at what they have fueled. Yeah. Can, can we... Can we I I love what you're saying here, and I want to dive in a little bit deeper because um, one thing that's frustrated, I know, me and probably Carrie for, for a little bit, is thinking about this as an intellectual movement, because it's armed with the rhetoric of postmodernism, it's very deft and agile at uh, dodging any darts you throw at it or any criticism, because, of course, with postmodernism, literally anything is possible, and so you know, anything can be justified. And so because it has the tools of postmodernism, it's been very difficult to to nail down as an ideology in many ways. And I started to think about it instead as some sort of mass psychological dysfunction and not really think about it as something that needs to be intellectually argued with as an ideology so much as something that needs to be managed and dealt with as you would a group of mental patients. I know that's very maybe pretty harsh, but can you talk about what the, how much of this is, is ideological and how much of this is just psycho, psychological dysfunction? Well, I spend a lot of my time now trying to convince um, many of the people I'm in contact with that what you're saying is almost literally correct, that this is a kind of mass psychosis and that we are in attempting to grapple with the arguments that it is leveling, making a fundamental error. You know, if you ran into a psychotic person on the street, they might have some understanding of the world that was very clear to them, but it is not the right approach to imagine that you are going to reason them out of it, right? Because you can't see the world that they see, and it is, it is born of internal processes. In this case, there may be, and undoubtedly are, psychotics in this movement, but the movement itself is like an emergent psychosis. And there's a point at which it levels arguments that are so bizarre and so insane that we are freed from responding. At the point that we are told male and female do not exist, that those are figments of our imagination, that we have been assigned a sex at birth, and that explains the differences between men and women, the game's over. That's not a real argument, right? That's the 
male and female have nothing to do with human beings. These go back hundreds of millions of years. They've leveled an argument that we know is false from the get-go. Likewise, the argument that maybe two plus two doesn't equal four, obviously this is insanity of one type or another. Either it's intentional, as we see on some people's parts, or it's not, and they actually believe this. But at the point that people are saying things that contravene reality so directly that any thinking person can spot the problem, we are no longer required to humor those arguments just because they have been made. I think that's, I love that you're saying that. Because that's, that's kind of my intuitive attitude about it. It's like, if you're going to scream that two plus two isn't four, we don't have any discussion left. There's nothing, I can't argue with that. Like it's, it's, it, it's even beyond like, the flat earth belief or the young earth creationism, right? These arguments have been settled, right? We know why two plus two equals four. It's not arbitrary. It has nothing to do with one race or another. You would get agreement on this between a, you know, a Mayan and a Greek, right? Cultures that had no interaction with each other. They discovered it because it's true. So yes, the, we are having our, empathy weaponized against us, and we are having our decency weaponized against us. Our, our sense that we must meet any argument with the counter argument is leaving us sputtering for words because we're being given arguments that are so obviously false that we don't have the counter argument that, at the ready because no one ever thought we would need it. Right. So how do you deal with, like, this is encouraging a little bit, but it's also horribly discouraging because if you said to me, Carter, go debate someone who's wrong about some things, I feel like I could do that if I prepped enough. Uh, but if you said, Carter, go deal with this psychotic on the street, I'd be like, I don't know what to do. I'm going to run inside and lock the door. I don't. How do you deal with this then? Well, a couple things. One, um, because we have such a long history in the West of settling arguments in favor of reality. There are a lot of tools which are still in existence, but may be too dusty for us to reach for them. Um, so the idea that sophistry is well understood, right? We know what it is and we have the right to call it out as sophistry rather than meet each argument uh, on its face. So that's important. The other thing is to separate our compassion for people from our obligation to humor them. In other words, you may not be doing the psychotic a favor by humoring their view of the world. It doesn't mean you aren't obligated to get them some help, right? A person who is suffering a psychosis is deserving of our compassion. And a movement that is suffering a psychosis is built of people who are deserving of our compassion. And to the extent that what is fueling this is genuine anger at a system that has given people low quality tools, has not protected them from falling off the bottom of the ladder, in which great many people feel vulnerable to a system that is all too frequently heartless. We can talk about how to take care of these people without pretending that they're making sense. Hmm. So I, I have a part of what we do. So that, that answers the question of how to engage or do you engage with the psychotic part of this belief system. But to go back for a second to the useful tools or the people that I, I sometimes, I, I also call them the PC liberals, those are the people I spend a lot of time thinking about and trying to make sure that I don't forget that I want to speak to them, um, that I don't want to become just in an echo chamber of people who agree with me about this belief system, because I think those are the people that can be pulled out of it. I was one of those people. And so how do we, how do you talk to th those people are still open to hearing argumentation, I think. So, um, Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So how do, how do we, and, and maybe this is a natural springboard to talk about unity 2020 eventually, because I think there are a lot of liberals who are still in this movement or at least maybe have casually accepted some of the tenets of this belief system, um, but are also starting to question certain things about it. And how do we make a case for those people? How do we help them see that this is not liberalism? Well, in some sense, this is a question of upregulating adulthood, 
the fact is the person that humors the psychotic because they think they're doing them a favor is actually harming the psychotic. And to the extent that people are motivated by good intentions, or at least by a belief that they are not doing harm, that those people are actually doing grave harm and putting something, you know, if, if we take seriously the idea that the West is so thoroughly built on racial injustice that we have to level it in order to build a functional society, we are going to harm all of the people in this movement, right? We're going to create a world in which there is no United States, and that is going to leave the rest of the Western countries vulnerable. It's going to leave a power vacuum in which uh, China is very likely to become ascendant as the greatest world power. That is not a racially just world that we are building. That is a, um, a violent and dangerous, highly racialized world. And it's not going to serve the interests of the people who are protesting and rioting in our streets. So... I think the answer is, look, you haven't been given a good choice, right? You've been given a slate of bad choices. You can endure accusations that aren't true about you in an effort to do the right thing long term. But by, by acquiescing to this worldview, you are actually setting us all up for a catastrophe. And the nature of catastrophes is they fall hardest on the most marginalized. So in a sense, what we have to say is, if you, really, if you really believe those liberal values, and you should, then you have an obligation to find some courage, because in the long run, the only chance we have is to take the actual injustices that exist in our system and correct them, not to blow up the system and start over, because that's not, that's not going to work. So I like that. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that makes sense. And I'm, I'm wondering, there's a phrase in your bio that I was contemplating, and, and I just, it, I'm now thinking about it again. So I just want to ask you about this. Um, when you talk about game theoretically stable paths forward for humanity, um, I imagine that you're thinking about all this stuff in a very, at a very high level and a very long viewpoint of, you know, where does humanity go? I mean, you're, you know, evolutionary biology is, is not a, you know, a 10 year time span, right? It's, it's thousands and thousands of years, millions per, perhaps. Um, can you can you walk through what you mean by a game theoretically stable path forward for humanity and how you think that relates here and now to what we should be doing to kind of prevent, for example, China from swooping into a power vacuum and, and, and taking over or, you know, destroying the West? Sure. So first of all, the reason that I love evolutionary biology is that it provides very powerful tools for understanding complex adaptive systems. Now, very frequently, what it spits out when you've realized what's going on sounds counterintuitive when you say it out loud. Um, so one of the things that I've realized in thinking evolutionarily about humans is that in order to be compassionate, one has to do dispassionate analysis. Right. So if you skip that, if you don't know that and you decide, well, we have to be compassionate. So when we do analysis, our compassion should be front and center. You will end up harming a great many people out of your desire to help. Whereas if you can put aside your compassion, right, it's still it's still alive and well and active, but it's not party to the conversation. You can say, well, what is the best way to help people? And how can I help these people without harming other people? And if we can now skip to the, the core of the question you've asked, human beings are a very special case of a very ancient and generic pattern. All creatures are effectively seeking what an economist would call growth. So creatures are searching design space for adaptations, for patterns that allow them to increase their population size, to put it in relatively simple terms. When they find something, they respond to it by increasing their population and exploiting whatever opportunity is they've found. So that can be a new valley, 
You know, you can have a dandelion that finds its way into some valley where there are no dandelions, and then the population uh, booms. But eventually, the creature, whatever it is, finds the limits of that opportunity, and population growth stalls. And we reach what's called carrying capacity. So what this means is that evolution for every creature, whether it has a mind, whether it has any uh, capacity to calculate anything at all, is a search for opportunities to grow. Now that puts human beings in a special bind given the way we function. What it does is it means that we tend to seek opportunities. They can be new geographic locations, although now that we've come all the way around the globe and mapped it, there aren't going to be new places to go, you know, short of Mars maybe. But what we do is instead we innovate and we find ways to make more of less. So when hunter-gatherers switched to farming, their populations increased greatly. It was as if they had discovered a new place to live. But because that system has boom and bust cycles built into it, it creates a problem. You have a population that rises to some level, and people, just like every other creature, experience the growth that comes along with that as a very positive thing. And then that growth collapses very naturally, not because anyone's made an error, but just because the opportunity has been filled. Now, that boom and bust cycle results in a tremendous amount of human against human violence, that in a quest for growth, when human beings don't have a place to go, when they don't have some new innovation that can relieve the pressure of having reached the limits of population, they go after each other, and they very often do it along racial lines. I can see you have a question, Carrie. No, I no. don't yet. You're just okay. making me realize something. Keep going. <laughs> okay, I, I've got a quick. I've got a quick question. I think. Um, yep. So I'm. You're making me think of economic arguments. I've heard probably because you're using boom and bust as as the your your language here. Um, but you know, one of the the differences I think of when there's a let's say a dandelion in the valley, um, that innovation. Let's call the valley an innovation for dandelions. Uh, that that innovation is singular and rare, whereas in modern society, couldn't you make an argument that there's constant innovation, and so we can avoid having to have these bust cycles of of where we have to fight each other for resources, so long as we continue to innovate. So that's essentially the cornucopian argument, and the problem is there's you know if you zoom far enough out. You can say, yes, there's always new innovations. But if you zoom in, you'll find that there can be long periods of time where nothing substantial changes, right? So, for example, if you uh, – I'm a big fan of the, the film 2001, which was made in 1968. Now, they, Kubrick and Clark did us a great favor in labeling the exact moment in time that they were predicting. These were brilliant men. Right, Clark has, to his credit, the invention of the geostationary satellite, among other things. So these were very insightful, scientifically-minded people who projected that in the year 2001, we would have a permanent moon colony, we would have uh, space stations orbiting the Earth in which thousands of people would pass as we currently pass through airports. Um, we would have uh, the ability to put astronauts into stasis, that we would be traveling to the outer planets. Um, none of these things came to pass. In fact, the only thing that came anywhere close to being where their proje projection had us in 1968 is video conferencing, which didn't arrive in a good form in 2001, but at least it was somewhere within uh, a decade or two. So what that tells us is that scientifically aware people in 1968 wildly misunderstood the rate of progress, right? They were extrapolating from an era in which we were about to land men on the moon and return them to the Earth safely. And if you extrapolate linearly from where we were, you would think, well, Mars can't be that far off, and then how far can the outer planets be? And so the problem is we tend to extrapolate from these very uh, productive phases. And then we are surprised by what I don't think should ever surprise us, which is diminishing returns. Diminishing returns is a law of the complex systems universe, and it always sets in. And it means that you can't calculate how difficult it is to get to Mars by just saying, well, how much farther is it than the moon? It's actually many orders of magnitude harder than you would expect on that basis. So 
to expect progress to constantly rescue us from the limits of population is going to constantly put us in trouble where human populations will, instead of enduring decades of stasis, um, engineer a kind of phony growth by either borrowing from our future at cost to later generations or attacking populations that can't defend their resources. That's what we do instead. So we, we engineer something that feels like growth, but actually what it's built of is warfare and genocide. So my hope is that we can recognize this pattern and we can understand what the real problem is for humanity. If we wish to be compassionate, we have to end the processes that result in people justifying warfare and genocide against other populations. And the way to do that is to produce something that feels to people like growth without requiring external growth to be discovered. And that is not an impossible task at all. In fact, you can see a kind of prototype of this logic in the way uh, corporations once functioned and still do in certain parts of the world. So as people, you know, used to sign up in some sort of a career path inside a corporation, their earning potential would go up over the, the their lifetime. And to a person, the fact that they would have the capacity to, you know, they would have more wealth and therefore the capacity to do more of what they wanted uh, felt like they had wandered into a new valley, right? Now, you could have that growth in your earning capacity in the midst of a recession, right? You didn't have to have actual growth in order to engineer the sensation of growth. And so I won't drag you into the details too deeply, but you will notice that inside your house, it's pretty much always spring, right? We set the temperature so that it feels like spring, and spring is a very nice time. Um, so we have, without violating any laws of physics, we have engineered something that feels very hospitable and pleasant in the limited space in which we live. And what we need to do is figure out how to engineer a kind of economic spring that is perpetual for humanity so that our best instincts, our compassionate side, rules rather than the side that rationalizes warfare and genocide, which is the alternative. Okay, lay it on me. How? <laughs> well, <laughs> here's the bad news. Um, <laughs> The bad news, I suspect, is that we can do, we can prototype this with current technology. Probably in order to stabilize it long term, you're going to need something like fusion power. And I must say, I am a tremendous skeptic of uh, fission power. Fission power is very, very dangerous, and it's sort of a a false solution because the costs are very frequently deferred and then spectacular. But fusion power is very different. Fusion power is very difficult to accomplish, but having accomplished it is comparatively safe and has the potential to generate an indefinitely large amount of energy. Now, if we deployed fusion technology today, if we had the ability to generate electricity through fusion power, we would probably make things worse, that it would end up being used to amplify many of the economic dynamics that create wild disparities in opportunity and well-being. But if we see it coming, if we recognize that fusion power is something that we will eventually harness at a level that it uh, is what powers the, the sockets in your house, then we can prepare for it. And we can say, actually, this is so important this is so vital to human beings not going to war with each other that it must not be held privately and wielded as a weapon. It is a public good, and we must treat it as the opportunity to free ourselves from this historical dynamic once and for all. So in the same sense that we are not violating a law of physics by turning your uh, home climate into perpetual spring, right? Why is that not violating a law of physics? Because, well... Your air conditioner is spitting heat into your backyard, right? It's just simply transporting heat out of your house and into your backyard, and that's a mundane process. We can do that same thing for all of the other economic processes that result in boom and bust cycles, and we can do so in a way that liberates people to spend their time on things that are actually meaningful, which is frankly what we would, what we would all hope for. Now, 
I do have to say one thing, otherwise I will be dismissed as a utopian. Okay. I am not arguing for a perfect world. I am not arguing that this will result in um, perfect fairness. This is a steady state and not an equilibrium, which means it is something we would have to manage intelligently the way your thermostat manages the temperature in your house, rather than something that we will imagine will just simply unfold if we provide it the, uh, the habitat in which to evolve. Not to get Malthusian or say ver <laughs> verboten words on this show, but I'll do it anyway. Um, aren't you concerned? Like, so look, ch cheap, clean energy, or as you're saying, uh, I'll put in quotes, free clean energy to everyone, right? Um, is clearly, I mean, energy is the, the backbone of civilization. So clearly you can do a lot with that. Um, but I'm concerned about evolutionary pressures on the human species generally and setting up a system of dysgenics is not a great idea how do you manage the species moving forward so that you have actually uh a a, a population that's stable that doesn't actually decline in its cognitive and psychological health well, so first of all, I would say that's a fair question, but we obviously have that problem with the current system. So it's not like that's a problem that sets in at the point that we attempt to build the steady state I'm talking about. Um, so anyway, I would say, yes, it's an obligation that we deal with that. But in some sense, the problem is already here. Whether or not I'm right about the necessity of a steady state, we have to address that problem. And overwhelmingly, um, this is the question that should be occupying us. In fact, the book that my wife and I, my wife being Heather Hying, also an evolutionary biologist, um, the book that we are writing, The Hunter-Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, is focused on this exact question, that the evolutionary novelty of our moment is making us um, sick. It's making us psychologically sick, it's making us physically sick, and it is making us socially sick. And that um, is the consequence of the fact that we are creatures that are adapted to many different prior habitats, none of which we live in. So that is simply a question that demands an answer right away. Many of the maladies that we suffer, um, the rampant need for orthodontia, for glasses, for drugs to compensate for this and that, to for you know, molecules to help us get to sleep. All of these things are the result of the fact that we've introduced some influence whose consequence we don't spot. And we have to recognize that that's a problem that will be with us from here on out, and that we've, we have to get much better at recognizing that our best intentions always come with unintended consequences. It is our job to spot those consequences and to figure out whether the net effect of things we are doing is positive. If the net effect isn't positive, we shouldn't do them. And we should, often have, we should often find that there are mechanisms to mitigate the downsides if we are aware that they are sure to accompany whatever it is we're trying to accomplish. Can I have interrupt with a probably a dumb question, but I think we'll, there will help some people in our audience as well. So if what you're saying, Brett, about fusion and free energy is that this is going to simulate this growth, this feeling of feeling growth for us? It won't simulate it if we just simply have unlimited or indefinitely large amounts of energy. We will have to figure out how to deploy that so that it feels like growth to people, which is not a simple problem, but it's tractable. I would also point out, though, that, you know, some part of you is undoubtedly whether you're believers in anthropogenic climate change or not, some part of you, if you're a rational person, is worried about climate change and that it's going to get out of control. And if you're paying attention to the exact nature of the threat, you know that there's an awful lot of methane frozen in the Arctic that could suddenly be released at some threshold point that we can't see coming, right? Mm -hmm. Fusion power allows us to not only halt global warming, but to reverse it, right? If you have indefinitely large amounts of energy, you can actually take carbon out of the atmosphere and you can reverse the process. No other technology offers that potential. So 
this really is a question of humanity having come to a bottleneck point, a threat to our ability to continue on this planet, and that very same moment is the one at which we have the potential to become something new, which is a species that can wisely manage the hazards that we ourselves create. And as I see it, one of two things will happen. Either the wisdom will emerge for us to recognize that our immense power requires us to address these hazards and to stop navigating based on the faith that something will save us, or we won't, and we will keep doing what we're doing, and it's going to be a very short ride. Nobody can say exactly what's going to happen to humanity, but the number of things that threaten us is many, and the only solution to them is wisdom. I need, excuse me, I need to go buy some SpaceX stock. <laughs> um, I have to say, even if Mars was somewhere to go, it's not going to be very pleasant. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Unfortunately, I... I... I agree with you. It's not actually a tenable solution. Um, may so looking, ahead, Carrie. looking ahead to the future and and to next steps about where we're at currently, I did want to ask you about, we want to talk to you a little bit about Unity 2020. Carter and I have had some disagreements about it. Uh, I'm a, a lifelong Democrat who uh, for about 20 years was also what I call a social justice warrior. Um, still a liberal, but I'm part of the walk away movement. And uh, I recently decided I was going to vote for Trump because I look at my options and I felt, well, he's the only one speaking against my old ideology, which which is a belief system that terrifies me now. And I, I felt like the Democrats have become beholden to it the same way that our corporations have become beholden to it, you know, our um, uh, academics. Uh, cultural, all of our cultural institutions. So I decided I was going to vote for Trump, but I've been keeping an eye on UD 2020. I did vote for Tulsi in the primaries, and I like that you have her paired with Crenshaw. Can you tell uh, our viewers a little about UD 2020? What's the idea behind it? Sure. Um, for those of us who have understood that we have a real problem in the U.S. that comes from structural elements of our democratic process, which tends to produce a incoherent two-party dynamic, right? We have first-past-the-post voting, which results in giant, unwieldy, and incoherent coalitions forming. They form in the form of two parties. Um, for those of us who recognize that that problem has created a landscape hospitable to corruption and hostile to useful change, we are frequently met with the argument that if you contemplate anything outside of that structure, you will elect the greater evil. That basically, if you decide what the alternative to the duopoly should look like, and you attempt to marshal it, that whatever values you imbue this new structure with will rob the party that's closer to those values of power and empower the one farther away and therefore um, create a, a landscape of the greater evil. So Unity 2020 is a structural plan to defeat that argument such that challenges to the duopoly can exist. It involves um, a, an exercise of balance. The plan, for those who haven't heard of it, is that we draft two candidates, one from the left and one from the right, under the agreement that once elected, they will govern by consensus as a team. The person who runs at the top of the ticket will be chosen by a coin flip. After four years, the positions reverse, and this will continue until somebody has inhabited the role of the presidency twice and is no longer eligible, at which point they can be replaced on the ticket, and this can go on indefinitely. So the point of this is that it is non-ideological. It recognizes the duopoly as the problem that needs to be challenged, and therefore is appealing to people who come from all parts of the political spectrum who recognize that corruption and dysfunction are the obstacles to good governance, not the other side. And um, this has been uh, a very interesting exercise. A movement has emerged. Um, we have succeeded in doing a number of things. We went through a nomination process. We found that at the top of our nomination process, we had six names, 
though we did not engineer it this way, three from the right, three from the left. We then figured out what the nine possible tickets were. We went through a voting, a ranked choice voting process, which I would argue is a, a, an important accomplishment as well. And the top ticket is Tulsi Gabbard and Dan Crenshaw, who happen to be friends from one from the Democratic Party and one from the Republican Party, and uh, both very decent people who are committed to the well-being of the nation. So that's where it stands. So and so, where? How do you? Uh, for people who are asking, how do you get? How do you get them on the ballot? Because well, I know there are people saying, "Well, how is this going to work?" And now you have a ticket. How do you vote for them? So I will say we don't have a ticket. The the thing is constructed as a draft, and the idea is at the point that the American public realizes what a dangerous situation the major parties have left them in, they will want an alternative and a groundswell composed of people who are frightened for the well-being of the nation would allow us to draft these people and approach them and say, um, your country needs you. Um, so how do we get on the ballot? Well, the danger of this moment became apparent late in this process. And the duopoly has, of course, set up rules to make it very difficult to get ballot access. So there are different requirements in every state and the District of Columbia for large numbers of signatures that need to be collected and validated. And that is all designed to protect the duopoly, which offers um, nothing desirable from competition that would otherwise uh, dislodge it. So our point has been, this is not a moment for ideology. Unity 2020 is not a party, it is a movement, and it is not ideological, it is apolitical. And what we have asked is that those third parties that have ballot access consider the danger of this moment and recognize that they could partner with us. They have very good reason to do this, incidentally. A third party that garnered 5% of the vote in the federal election would get federal funds in the next election cycle. This, this year, that would have been worth something like $20 million. Um, they would also um, avoid the trap of oscillating between being a historical footnote based on how little vote they get or being regarded as spoilers when they get a small but significant fraction of the vote. In this case, they could be regarded as heroes by uh, imbuing a non-ideological movement with the power to recapture the White House on behalf of the American public. I love it. <laughs> so I've, I've got... Okay, I've got questions about this because you, when you speak about social justice ideology, I'm like a cheerleader for you. I'm like, all oh, I'm like, this guy totally gets it. I love how you articulate it. You're you're brilliant. And for me, I'm looking at the world, and, and I'm the the caveat here is, I've I've not ever really been super concerned with politics. So we can put that. Maybe that has some some relevance here. But I look at the this the current state of our, our world and I think, well, this social justice ideology or mass delusion or mass psychosis or whatever you want to call it is the existential threat to the West. It's more important than anything else that's happening. And, you know, where Carrie and I got into disagreement about Unity 2020 was I said, well, Brett Weinstein understands this, but I don't see any language in Unity 2020 that is sticking up specifically against social justice ideology. It needs to be fought ideologically. And the only candidate that I see that actually does it is not a guy that I would want to hang out with very much. And I probably don't like him, but at least at least he's standing up against the social justice ideology. And so it, it, there's I, why is that not like front and center in Unity 2020? Why are you not saying like, hey, this is an existential threat to the West. We need to fight this. We can join together to fight this thing. And then we can go back to bickering or or even maybe worrying about politics and Unity 2020 might be a great solution to what I agree is a horrible duopoly with lots of corruption problems. All right. Um, I love the question. I'm going to give you a frustrating answer. <laughs> Good. The, uh, are you, have you read the book Guns, Germs, and Steel? It's sitting on my bookshelf, but I've not. I'm sorry. I've, I've, I failed in that one. Do not pass go. Pull it off your bookshelf. It's too long. 
but it's essential. And if you don't have the time to read it, check out the PBS series that will do it for you in three hours. Okay. The reason I raise it is because the argument in Guns, Germs, and Steel is effectively we don't understand history because we're standing too close to it. Right? If you imagine that history is a matter of people who make individual decisions on which a great deal rests and that you know that you have to understand the nature of what was in the minds of these people who made the decisions and how it unfolded on the battlefield and this and that, you won't get it. Right? It's all noise. If you zoom out, you'll realize that there are certain things that give one population an advantage over another. When these populations come into contact, who wins is a foregone conclusion based on uh, technological differences or immunological differences. And so anyway, that's nothing but an analogy here. But my point would be, you're right about the threat that this ideology poses, but you're standing too close, okay? What caused that threat? I would argue that what caused that threat was the dysfunction of the duopoly, right? You have two corrupt parties that have frozen the American public out of power. And what they do is they engage in a kind of theater in which they argue that they are each acting in the interests of the public. What they do is they accumulate power by virtue of some small number of us holding our nose and voting for one or the other. And then they monetize that power by selling it. They're influence peddling rackets. And this has several important consequences. One, if you look at the Hidden Tribes report, which if you haven't seen it, you should definitely check it out. The Hidden Tribes report says that there's something like 67% of the American public that is what they call the exhausted middle. These are people who basically agree on what a good civilization would look like, and they are being drowned out by these fringes on the far left and the far right. Now, this this works for me. I've seen this exhausted middle. I'm part of this exhausted middle. And I've seen the fringes drive the conversation, and uh, there's no need for it. The parties themselves have prevented that exhausted middle from uh, steering policy because they maintain power, which they then monetize, by keeping us divided. So they have used divisive issues to basically distract us from the parasitism that is occurring. This has left a great many of people, a great many people frozen out of well-being, feeling vulnerable to all kinds of things, from you know, being wiped out from a medical catastrophe to being unable to retire. And that anger has spilled out into our streets in the form of a movement that's very confused about what the actual obstacle to their well-being is. That movement, if it was properly targeted, would be targeted at political corruption and at uh, the hoarding of opportunity that these parties have facilitated. But nonetheless, that threat, the key to dealing with that threat long term is to return power to the American people so that, um, that the policy of government once again serves their interests. And you know, this is another thing that we've seen elucidated. We now know, scientific study reveals that governmental policy is almost uninfluenced by the desires of the electorate. We are involved in theater as policy is serving others. So if you agree that that is what's going on, then you will recognize that the ultimate solution to social justice ideology and whatever uh, other false solutions might emerge is to address the corruption problem of the duopoly. And then I would say, as a final piece, you say, well, one of these um, candidates is opposed to the social justice ideology, and the other clearly isn't. And I would agree with that analysis. But if you think that Donald Trump winning is going to solve this problem, I think you haven't really understood its nature. Basically, That's we are being... I Go don't ahead. think it will. Just, oh, just well, let me, I don't think let me, it will. I want to jump in here because this is my, this has been my, this was my holdup about deciding whether or not to vote for him. And you, and you reminded me of it because, um, my fear of him, my fear about him being reelected is, is about, you know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And I'm afraid about 
the how this is going to propel social justice ideology further if he gets rid because we I saw what happened in 2016. I personally woke up, and I know other people like myself who woke up and went in one direction. I, but but there were plenty of people who were in my social justice world who doubled down and culturally, like at large, the ideology itself doubled down. It's very it's gone mainstream now. And people who back then that I knew who, who were not even social, I wouldn't have even called them social justice warriors. They're all in now. The casual ones, the sleeper cells, they've been activated. You have to start speaking it now. And so part of my, my hesitancy about uh, deciding to vote for him was that I was thinking, well, what reaction is this going to provoke from the left? And is it, is it actually going to make the demon that I'm trying to fight worse? Um, and so I, I think at some point I just I just got past that because I was thinking, well, what other option do I have? And maybe also there's a part of me that just resentfully or angrily is like wants to stick it to the social justice people and felt like, well, he'll do that. <laughs> well, so anyway, now I'm just confessing things. <laughs> no, no, I, no. I think this is very, this is very useful because I think a lot of people are, you know, somewhere in this process of sorting out. Well, if you believed that this was a great threat, what would the rational reaction be? And many people have settled on the solution that you're suggesting, and for the exact reason that you're saying, it feels like, well, this, you know, this movement's trying to back me into a corner, and somebody is saying no. Why wouldn't I vote for them? And right. among other things, I would say. You know, some, some years ago, I put out a video called Speak of the Devil. And the point of that video was that the social justice left is demonizing people on the right on the basis that it is white supremacy that has caused the dysfunction of our society. That's not true. But it is going to create a kind of white supremacy by backing white people against the wall together. And it will be very natural for people who've been backed against the wall together to team up to fight back. And so my concern is that you have two failure modes. And believe me, uh, there is plenty to fear if the Democrats win this coming election. But I don't see that there is less to fear if the Republicans win it. I see it as two different failure modes. And... This is exactly why somebody like me would engage in a admittedly far-fetched proposal like Unity 2020, is that I don't think we really have a choice. I think at some level, we have to figure out what the way out is, right? And among other things, we have discovered in marshalling this plan that the duopoly has uh, friends that are willing to violate their own rules and be spotted doing it in the tech sector. No, I don't think this comes as a surprise to anyone, but the fact that Twitter has shut down Unity 2020's account on the basis of a false accusation, the evidence of which they will not let us see, um, our appeal of their shutdown of our account has been ignored. This tells us how the duopoly stays in power. You have, to, you have to make the attempt to dislodge it before you can even discover what it is that protects it. And so we are learning quickly what the duopoly is made of and how it stays in power despite providing absolutely atrocious candidates as it has done in this case. I will say that getting banned from Twitter did make me like Unity 2020 more. Oh, um, <laughs> it was def It's a feather in your cap. So I, I want to get back to something else that you, you said, though, because I'm... I, um, I kind of agree with you when you say, like, if you agree that the du duopoly has done X, Y, and Z, like, I, sort of, although I wouldn't necessarily even refer to it as the duopoly. And I think that the, the Republicans and the Democrats definitely have shared values, and those values uh, predominantly uh, center around, frankly, uh, the military-industrial complex, regardless of what the Democrats say. Uh, both parties love going to war and love, love going to war in places most people haven't heard of, and 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 funding Lockheed Martin like they, they love that um, the other thing is uh, they they both really like expanding government control and power M maybe some of them maybe Republicans in one area more and Democrats in the other area more but they both like their own flavors of authoritarianism they love the central banking system I mean I've, I'm the one who's made arguments in the past about look you know the Occupy Wall Street people were right to be upset they just 
I think they pointed their anger, especially now that it's been taken over by social justice ideology, they're pointing their anger in the wrong direction, but the anger's real and it's, it, there really is a plutocracy and it really does need to be dealt with. And so I totally agree with that. I look at Donald Trump as a stay of execution. He, he's gonna keep him at bay and we need to figure out how to change our culture because I'm not convinced that the, the solution will lie in any sort of political change. It, as long as we've got people being educated in the universities the way they are and going through social justice indoctrination and frankly, even prior to social justice, the philosophy departments, in my humble opinion, in universities have been uh, just a, a, a sewer for 50, 60 years. So, I mean, this stuff has, has, has gone on. You can talk to Michael Rechtenwald about his journey through uh, <laughs> through his, his uh, English PhD and then being involved in, in, in postmodernism. I just I look at I look at this and I say that the problem is so deep. I I'm I kind of dismiss almost all political solutions with the exception of like, here's a bull in a China shop who will piss them off for another four years and maybe keep them at bay. Does that make sense? It does. And uh, I have to be very careful here, but the duopoly was beaten by Donald Trump. He proved you could do it, right? He is not yeah. fundamentally a Republican. He is a, an insurgent who succeeded. Now, in 2016, when he succeeded in beating the Republican Party, Bernie Sanders almost succeeded in beating the Democrats in a parallel way. And um, Bernie Sanders, I believe, is more constrained by a sense of moral obligation, and that prevented him from actually winning. But nonetheless, the duopoly is vulnerable, and Donald Trump is the proof. The problem is, A, you have to deal with the danger that although Donald Trump has what it took to beat the duopoly, he does not have what it takes to lead carefully. And he is very likely to, if he wins again, inflame the social justice left and embolden the fringe on the right. Not because it's necessarily what Donald Trump wants. I don't know what Donald Trump wants. What I can see is that he's very good at playing politics and therefore he's utilizing people's prejudices in order to, um, to maintain his position. But the, I, I think the question is, many people, in fact, almost everybody, sees one of these two failure modes very clearly, right? They either see the danger of uh, the Democrats, which are uh, humoring this ideology, or they see the danger of the Republicans who are so deaf to the idea that there's a problem. As you point out, the anger is real. Occupy Wall Street was initially targeted at exactly the right thing, and then it got co-opted. Um, but you have to see that we are trapped between two dangers. And the answer is we have to do something different. The whole reason that Unity 2020 had to occur was that we had been kept captive of this system by this argument that to do anything outside of it was to empower the worse failure mode, right? Now, in that, I mean, let's be honest. I remember when Mitt Romney was the greater evil that we could not afford to risk, right? <laughs> There's always a greater evil that we can't afford to risk. Right, but but that's the thing. Just yeah. tune back into that moment and imagine that we were having this argument because I was, okay? Yeah. I was arguing this duopoly is going to get us killed. We have to escape it. And I was told you can't do it now because Mitt Romney is so evil, <laughs> right? Now, the same people who told me that are now saying, why couldn't we have somebody reasonable like Mitt Romney, right? Yeah. Um, likewise, George W. Bush. So here's my point. This gets worse, not better. Okay, if you think it can't get worse than Donald Trump, you don't know what you're talking about, right? You don't know enough history. So we have to address this at some point. We have to escape this argument. The walkaway movement is right to walk away from the Democratic Party. It is wrong to walk into the arms of the Republican Party. So a different walkaway movement has to happen, and it has to be in the form of, you know what, I'm not buying that lesser evil bullshit anymore, right? 
I'm actually going to articulate the way the country is supposed to function, and we're going to go for it. And you can blame us for whatever you like. But the fact is, this is on those of you who are keeping the duopoly alive. This is not on those of us who are trying to figure the way out. Okay. But do you think, do you think a, let's just pretend that Crenshaw and Gabbard, both of whom I like better <laughs> than the alternatives, right? But do you think a, a Crenshaw and, and Gabbard uh, presidency would actually roll back any of the, like, yeah, there's a duopoly, but are we just switching kings? Are we like, okay, so there's these two kings fighting constantly, and now we have a different hegemonic power structure doing the same thing, giving us the Patriot Act and, you know, butting into our lives constantly and sending us to wars. Like, what's the, how do we, how does this stop that? Well, uh, one thing I would say is that you have to understand how the duopoly stays in power. One thing that's true is that it puts you through a test to see how good you are at the corruption game on the way to the White House, right? The idea of Unity 2020 is to speed you past that process so that nothing is able to corrupt you, so that when you arrive, you actually are your own person. And I believe that both Tulsi Gabbard and Dan Crenshaw are patriots. I believe they both want what's best for the country. I believe they do actually disagree over what direction we should head, but that we are in a position where the policy has for so long been rigged against the electorate that there is a, there's a tremendous amount we can do that's simply in the electorate's interest before we ever get to the stuff over which we disagree. And I think if we elected a ticket like this, you would see that the patriotic instincts of those who had been freed from the corruption racket and placed in a position of power would take over. And the reason it would take over is that, uh, as I was arguing to Justin Amash yesterday in our Unity Campfire, that there are three kinds of people in our system. We have people who will do the right thing no matter what. They are rare because they're not very well suited to a system built on corruption. We have people who will do the expedient thing no matter what the costs are. Those people are relatively common. And then we have people who will engage in the corrupt part of the system in order to succeed, but would prefer that the system weren't corrupt. And those people, given leadership at the top that had been sped past the corrupting influences, would emerge and they would be empowered to stand up. And so do I know for sure that that would work? I don't. But um, having spoken to Tulsi and Dan at various points, um, these people do not strike me as would be despots and tyrants. These are these are honorable people who have showed us that they are patriotic by their military service and in many other ways. So what what I like about this is that this is this is flipping the script in a in a different way. And it's to go back for a second to the what you said, Carter, about how the Donald Trump would at least keep the social justice left at bay. I'm not sure that he would. I, I think that I think he would in terms of, yes, he's just passed executive action trying to root critical race theory out of taxpayer funded federal labs. He He's going to oppose them. But does that keep it at bay or does that inflame it and make it worse and spread it? And so by well, it, hold on, just, it doesn't just allow me to wait. Allow, it doesn't power it doesn't people when they hear him say it. Right. Right. So, uh, so for example, when he first started criticizing this ideology and, and named it and said it had roots in Marxism or used the word Marxism, as you know, one of, on the one hand, I was glad that someone who, with that much power was speaking against it. But then on the other hand, I thought, oh, great. Now, every time I try to talk about this, they're going to say, oh, you're just a trumpet using a Trump talking point. And to, you're calling it Marxism because the president did. And they're not going to be able to hear me. And it's going to make it worse in some ways. And so, uh, I'm, what I'm thinking now, based on what you're saying, Brett, is I'm kind of going back to my fears about how him being elected in some ways is not keeping the ideology at bay, that it's going to force it to a head. And I think maybe our disagreement here, Carter, is that as we learned yesterday in an interview when they asked us if you could pick a marriage counselor for the country, <laughs> who would you pick? And I picked someone, and then you said I would pick a divorce attorney. <laughs> maybe you don't think unity is possible. 
Yeah, but so I still that, do. that's where I was going with this, which is I think maybe the fundamental thing is like I'm no longer convinced that unity is a viable option for the United States, and I'm happy to go play uh, with my marbles with other people who want to be left alone and let the social justice warriors burn themselves up in uh, a massive conflagration, mostly in California, probably. Who knows? No, no such solution exists. Um, believe me, I, I wouldn't be in favor of it if I thought it did exist. I believe that we have to find unity. But the fact is, there is no way to geographically separate us. You can't separate the cities from the rural places. You can't separate the coasts from the middle of the country. This is not the first civil war. This is a conflagration that will destroy the nation. And the belief that we can have some kind of separatism that will solve the problem, um, not only is it the wrong solution, it's not a viable solution. Well, I will. we can disagree about the wrong yeah. thing, but I am concerned about the viability of it, which does give me angst because I recognize that, like, I, you know, where would you go? It is largely cities and rural areas, and it's like I don't know how that how that really works. Um, so I'll concede that the viability. I think is we're at. The question. I would also add to make to muddy this just a bit. I know we've got to wrap up, but I think this is also where we differ. Is that I think there's unity, and I, I think I think unity is possible, and I think that this is not just a cultural problem, as you, you and I agree on, Carter. But I think this is also a spiritual problem in some ways. And because you're, because we disagree on spirituality, I think maybe that's a. Anyway, I'm sorry I'm boring you, Professor Weinstein. You gave me a, a lot to think about. You're not. You're, you're not boring <laughs> now, me. Now I'm and just talking to him. <laughs> no, let me say, um, you know, because of my background, I don't use the term spirituality very much. I'm a believer in its importance, but a, it's not a tool that I'm uh, particularly comfortable with. Uh, but I do think in, in, a, in a general sense, this is the right neighborhood. And I will say that my experience in talking this way is that there is a tremendous relief and camaraderie that comes from the discovery of there being a unity movement, that effectively this is the reinvention of a patriotic mode and the discovery that there is a hugely diverse group of people who is sick of being jerked around based on political prejudices and other such things that does yearn to see a fair country well governed it it yearns to see meritocracy where people all make it to the starting line and then the question is what will you invest and what can you bring to bear and what can you show us that we don't know so you know inside the unity movement we have a tremendous number of highly dedicated volunteers i'm interacting with them multiple times a day i don't know which side of the political aisle most of them come from and i don't care right it really doesn't matter once you get to the point of realizing that actually no matter what you do we are trapped on the same ship together and we really ought to get to know each other so that we can steer it through dangerous waters once you reach that place I don't know if we're going to fail and we're going to watch this thing come apart, but frankly, I'd rather be with those people. I'd rather be with people who understood that this was very serious and that, you know, succeed or fail, we have to try. That's the people I want to be with. And all I would say is for those of you who are looking at this situation and saying, I feel trapped, I feel there's no way out, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, you might be happier if you joined us and, you know, at least we're around people who weren't confused. So how can people find out more about the Unity Party since you've been banned from Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the best way to do it is to go to articlesofunity.org. Uh, from there, you can find a pointer to our YouTube channel where you will find our campfires are all cataloged. We have campfires um, every week. Uh, we have very interesting guests who come and talk to us about unity and related matters. And my guess is that people who are paying attention to your podcast, people who are awake in this way, will find it very comforting that there's a community of people engaged in that discussion and grappling with how it interacts with politics. Well, I, I feel like I could talk to you about this for the next four hours. And so but we have to go. Um, but I, I really appreciate you explaining I did have there was some cognitive dissonance with like, why is Brett 
doing this but not talking about social justice ideology. I think I understand that now, and it comports with this view of uh, this predom predominantly being a psychological issue that needs to be that needs to be dealt with. Um, so, okay, uh, I you're making me think of the book "Love Your Enemies" by Arthur Brooks. Have you read this book? I, I haven't. It's a pretty quick read. I think you would enjoy it. But he he gets to the heart of of this idea of us trying to get back to a place where we understand that we need each other, that conservatives and liberals need each other, and that we we will argue um, in defense of principles, or we should argue in defense of principles, and in, instead of in defense of tribe. Well, this is uh, this is absolutely right. And uh, one thing, you know, I'm a very progressive person, very far left, um, but I also recognize that the magic of, of the West involves a tension between the desire to make progress and a restraining force that keeps us from excess. And, you know, the fact that I think we need to make progress now, which is what puts me on the progressive left, is not an invalidation of what conservatives understand, which is that the attempt to make solutions brings unintended consequences. So it is that tension that we have to understand and protect. And, uh, you know, unity is the way there. Well, thank you very much for your time. This has been, like I said, this has been a great conversation. I could probably do it for, for many hours more. Um, and can you just remind uh, people, I know you said where to go about the Unity Party. How can they follow you uh, and remind people about your book that's coming out and your podcast? Sure. Um, yes, people should find the Dark Horse podcast. You can, if you want to watch, you can watch it on YouTube. We, my wife and I have been streaming live twice a week. We also have interviews with some really interesting guests. If you're more of a listening person, you can find it on your favorite podcast app. You can find me on Twitter at Brett Weinstein. Brett has one T. And uh, yeah, do check out Articles of Unity Dot org. The book is The Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, and you can't order it yet, but my wife and I are wrapping up the draft and we'll send it in and it will be available next year. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on and thank you for everything that you and your wife are doing. Thanks. This has so. been great. Thanks for watching. If you're new to the channel, we have a deep content library that includes interviews with everyone from Mike Cernovich to Megan Murphy, so go check it out. If you'd like to see more, please consider supporting the show by visiting unsafespace.com slash donate. You can find us on all the major social media platforms, at least for now. And you can find a community of like-minded individuals on our Unsafe Space chat on Telegram. See you there. Warning. This is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. The content of this production has not been authorized by the Cathedral. Pay no attention to it. For your protection, the following co-conspirators have been unpersoned and marked for cancellation. Please avoid any contact with these individuals. I have calculated a 96.8% chance that their opinions are obsolete. If you think about it, no one should be allowed to express opinions. But don't. Think about it, I mean. That's not your job. Thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. Having liberty is scary. Why keep it? You aren't using it anyway. Computer voice, Curtis, never mind, that last line is fake news. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake.